Hey there, and welcome back to Mr. Bashinsky's video tutorials. In this episode, you should learn how to analyze pedigrees simply and effectively. Oftentimes, these pedigrees, they can be very overwhelming. So I'm going to flip to one here. Just looking at this one here, it's asking for determine the mode of inheritance and the possible genotypes for individual 3-7. Now, many students right off the bat are going to go, oh my goodness, where should I start? The upside to this is there's actually a few basic rules you can use, and it's going to help you look at small parts of a pedigree instead of the entire thing at once. If we can look at small parts, we can start to determine the mode of inheritance, and then if we were ever asked to, we could do the possible genotypes after that. So let's do a quick review of just some basics in our pedigrees. All right, just so looking at a few basics, just so we know where we're headed. This square on the left here, this actually designates a male, and the circle right underneath is a female. Moving to the right side here, you can see the top one, this dark circle. It's actually going to be an affected individual. The, the affected individuals are colored in because that way we know that they are suffering for whatever condition, may it be X-linked, Y-linked, uh, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant. There's many things that it could be. So that's when it's affected, it's colored in completely. The second one here, this is an unaffected individual. When it says it's unaffected, it's saying it's just not displaying the phenotype that the condition may be. They may, however, be heterozygous for the condition and known as a carrier. In some pedigrees, they show carriers. Other pedigrees, they do not show carriers. And if you can guess the one underneath here, this is actually a carrier. You'll see that it has one allele for the condition and one allele for without the condition. So they, they will not be displaying the condition, however, but they are a carrier for it. And lastly, in the bottom left here, you can see that this line that I'm going to highlight right there, that is mating between individuals. So when it's a horizontal line, you'll see that it's that female on the left is mating with the male on the right. And the any sort of downward vertical line is going to indicate any sort of children. You'll see here that all the way across it, these two individuals have two daughters and a son. So now that we have the basics under our belt, why don't we go ahead and look to see the little system that we have to determine inheritance because if we know inheritance first we can then determine genotypes afterwards. So let's go on. So this is pedigree analysis and we're going to start right at the beginning and this is we're going to have a kind of a bimodal. We're going to have a choice between whether in this case it's going to be either recessive or whether it's going to be dominant and from there we're actually going to go ahead and determine whether it's either autosomal sex linked in either case. So to start it off, what we're going to do, we're going to determine if it's either a recessive or a dominant condition. To, to do that, we're actually going to take a look and we're going to start on the recessive side because generally they are easier to spot. If we remember all the way back to monohybrids, we can remember that when pea plants are crossed, if you cross a tall pea plant with a tall pea plant, there are times where a recessive short pea plant will be created. In that, for that to happen, of course, we need to have both individuals be heterozygous for the height allele. We can see in the recessive example that I have above here, we can see that both, both parents are actually unaffected by the condition, and they are creating a child with the condition. Sometimes what we can do is we can even just put some test genotypes in there just to see and we can say if these are creating a homozygous recessive that means that each parent must also have this recessive however they're not showing the trait so they also need to have a big a or a dominant allele and that is actually showing all the phenotypes there you'll see that in the parent generation neither of them are affected and in the children, the two of them are affected. We've, we call this and we describe this as 
skipping a generation. So it's a very, very easy way to identify any sort of recessive condition. One other easy way of determining whether if it's recessive or not is you can see the presence of carriers. Okay, so this here is a male carrier and this here is a female carrier. We know that you cannot be carrying the dominant allele because then you would be affected if it was a dominant tr inherited trait. We know that it's recessive because it is, they are carriers, they are indicated by half of their symbol shaded in. So if you see either of those two ways, those that are surefire ways to determine that it would be a recessive condition. So now what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at the dominant condition. With this, it's usually going to be in shown in every generation, unlike a recessive condition. Now looking for recessive is easier, but there is actually one way to prove that it's a dominant inherited condition. Again, thinking back to what we know about monohybrids, we know that if a homozygous recessive parent is mated with another homozygous recessive parent, they can only create a homozygous child. We know this is true because each individual can only donate a little a allele and therefore 100% of their children will be homozygous recessive as well. So if we look at the dominant example I have underneath here, we can see that there is an individual that's unaffected in the second generation. So if we were to box around these individuals, we would notice and remember back to what I wrote right here, saying that two parents with a recessive condition would always have to create children with that condition. 100% of their children would also have the condition. That's not the case right here. We can see that one of the children does not have the condition while both parents do. So we've deduced that it's a dominant inherited trait. So what we're going to do, we're also going to put in some test genotypes. So what we'll do right now is we'll put a little a, little a, because we know if it's dominant, that individual, they cannot have a capital A. And the only way to actually create a little a, little a from two people having the dominant condition, they must each have a little a, but they also have the condition. So we can also put in a big A for each individual. This is where it's always a good idea to have some sort of a legend, just like always, it's never changed, because you'll notice that little a, little a is the affected individual on the recessive side, and little a, little a is the unaffected individual on the dominant side of it. Write down something on the side to remember which allele is actually contributing to the condition. On the top, it's obviously the little a, which is creating an affected condition. And on the bottom here, it's actually the capital A that is creating the affected condition. Now that we've discovered whether it can be dominant or recessive, we actually will be needing to investigate whether the condition is either autosomal or whether it's sex-linked. And we do this for both the recessive side and the dominant side. The best way to do this is actually just check for some sort of sex-linked condition because if we can confirm that it's a sex-linked condition then we just have our work is done and if not then we can just assume that it will be an autosomal condition instead. If we recall back to our earlier genetics we know that genetically a female is XX and genetically a male will be XY. What we're going to do now we're going to look at the recessive half of it and we're going to try and decide whether it is an autosomal recessive condition or a sex link condition. And the easiest way to do that is actually to look at your affected females. Sex linked recessions are very easy to look for because what we do know is to be affected, we know that a female needs to be X little a, X little a, and even a male, they can only be X little a, why? What we're going to do, we're going to look at this individual right here. She is an affected female. So if it was sex linked, we do know that she's going to have two X's each with the recessive condition. 
if this individual is affected by a sex link condition, we know that she has no choice but to pass on one X with a little a on it to her sons, because obviously dad would be passing on the Y. And if we look right here, one of her sons does not have the condition. We looked at the affected female's son. We know that he does not have the condition, but you can also look at her father, and we can see that he also does not have the condition, which is interesting because he would have to be this for her to receive a X little a, because to donate to his daughter, he would have to be giving the X chromosome, and if she has the condition, her father must also have the condition. So if we were actually going to just go back, we could circle her parents and her, and we can definitely figure out that this is not a sex linked. And if it's not sex linked, we definitely know that it is an autosomal condition. Another easy way to spot an autosomal recessive condition is to look for a male carrier. We know that males cannot be carriers for an X-linked condition. They only have one, so they cannot be heterozygous for an X-linked condition. This other example right here, we can see that only males happen to be affected. Now, we do know it's a recessive condition because right here, we can see that two unaffected parents are creating an affected. But oftentimes when it's only males, you can suspect a sex link because males are more susceptible to an X link recessive condition just because males only have one X. They do not have that backup X. This same example on the right here, it cannot be proven or disproven whether it's sex linked. We can only suspect just because of the two affected males. If it was a little bit bigger, we may be able to determine using a couple females as well. Now that we've checked out the recessive, we're going to do the dominant side of it. It can also be autosomal or sex linked depending on the pedigree. And we're actually going to do that. And to figure that out, we're actually going to look at the affected males. So again, the rule of thumb falls. We're actually going to check whether these are sex linked or not. And well, we're going to do that by checking the affected males. Now, if you are affected by a sex linked dominant condition, we are going to write down some affected genotypes. Your female, you could have X with a big A or X with a big A again, or possibly even X big A, X little a. You can see that both still have the big A to have the condition. If you're, if you're a male, you can only be X big A, Y. Since we're looking at affected males, we can just consider this genotype. If we're going to assume a sex link dominant condition, we definitely know that this X right here is going to be coming from mom for sure, and it's going to be given to any sort of daughter. So if you see an affected male with any sort of a unaffected daughter or an unaffected mom right here you'll know for sure that it is an autosomal dominant condition in this example right here we're going to take a look at that affected male and we can actually see that he has two affected daughters out of two and he his mom is also affected by the condition pretty good evidence that this right here is going to be sex link dominant. So that's the end of this episode. Hopefully you have a better understanding of how to analyze pedigrees to determine the mode of inheritance. If you'd like to see some examples completed, you can check out the pedigrees example video. You'll see three different examples walk through step by step and you can put everything we've learned in this video into practice. Hopefully this was helpful and ideally you increased your knowledge on the concept. So thanks for listening and I'll catch you in the next episode.